All right, folks, for this next session, if you guys want to take a seat now, we're going to get started with the multi-unit session. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Jamie Stigliano, who's going to come on the stage and uh, rock it with, our, with, her, with her crew of guys to assist. Jamie, take it away. Zach, thank you. Zach. Zach, I think you mean my boy band. Come on. Okay. This is my, this is my, uh, this is my boy band. They're called, uh, they're called the Z's. <laughs> this is our, okay, tough crowd, okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so this is our, uh, the title of our session is Multi-Unit Franchisees Tell All. So this is my audition to be a, 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 a gossip talk show host, because there's just going to be a tell-all up here. Um, but in seriousness, I'd love to get us started after lunch, uh, something we do at all of our diva dance classes, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means and who I am after this, is I'd love for you to turn to the person next to you, because diva dance is all about inspiring confidence and building community. Uh, Josh did an awesome job talking about confidence earlier, totally resonated with me and the values of my company, but we're also all about community. So I'd love for you to turn to the person next to you and tell them if money were no object, time and knowledge were no object, what franchise would you want to own? What brand would you want to own? And it's not going to commit you to anything. Just tell them. What kind of concept? Not even a specific brand. I'd love to own a dog, something with dogs, something with snacks, something with ice cream. Tell a friend. What do you say, CJ? I'm going to steal his answer. NFL franchise. Nice, nice. He's like, you didn't say It's a good play. Yeah, I like that. It's got the word franchise in it. I legitimately think I would do Perspire. Okay, I love that. I honestly do. So you're loving it. Yeah. I love it. But it's not open yet, so it's pretty easy to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll call you back in a year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just a global, what'd you say? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Money's no object. Time is no object. Expertise. Anything? Okay, all right. He's like, why would I be working? <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, all right, friends. Why do I need a franchise? <laughs> okay, I'd love to hear a few answers. Miss Shane, what'd you say? Yeah, okay, okay, so she's sticking with what she knows. Okay, Sherry, what'd you say? If you could own any, any franchise brand, money's no object, time is no object, any concept, yeah, unit economics are no object, ha, ha, ha. What would you, what would yours be, Miss Sherry? Oh, an urban air, so fun, I love it. Well, I asked one, some of the guys up here, t CJ, tell them what you said. Does this work? Oh, you stole Hello. it from somebody. I stole it from Matt, but NFL franchise. An NFL <laughs> franchise. Mm -hmm. And and as Tanner will reveal, uh, he said the same the Perspire brand that he has now. Oh, so sweet. Okay. Well, just to properly introduce myself, my name is Jamie Stigliano. As you can tell, I'm really shy. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a brand called Diva Dance. We are dance choreography classes for adults. Um, I am in 35 cities. My headquarters is in Austin. Uh, some of y'all may have I've met many of you in the past when I had much fewer units and I had a lot fewer children. So I have two children I've had over the last couple of years, which is why I haven't been at all the conferences. But um, super thrilled to be here today. And thank you to Zach for, as always, talking me into doing something that I may not have wanted to do. That's fine. Uh, anybody relate to that? Okay, so we're talking about a multi-unit franchisees tell all, and um, I'm gonna just go ahead and go down and have the guys introduce themselves, and we'll start with CJ. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah, this isn't coming out. Um, from Nashville, Tennessee, I have eight locations of Great American Cookies, Marble Slab Creamery, and Pretzel Maker. Uh, Tanner Holmes from Chicago. Uh, I'm currently operating Sola Salon Studios and developing Perspire Salon Studios. Uh, Matt Forbush, I live in Memphis. Uh, have a partner in a group with about 50 uh, Annie Ann, Cinnabon, Hagen ha Dazs snack brands. Uh, but uh, my, the bulk of my time now, all of my time, is spent with Zignal, which is a back office management, ultimately providing a lot of the services franchisees cannot provide for franchisors for the fear of group employment. So we're going to call him Zignal Matt. Zignal? Zignal Matt. Zignal Matt. Got it. Also Matt, Matt Goebel, uh, multi-unit franchisee of Massage Heights out of Indianapolis. Also known as Woven Matt. Yes. So we have two and, and I, like Matt, also have a technology platform because if you have the name Matt, that's a cool thing to do. <laughs> right. Okay, now you're feeling about my boy band. Isn't this great? The Z's? Okay. All right, so the first question I want to start with is with CJ. Why the brands that you're with now? What, how'd you get there? Why did you choose those? 
So I grew up with Great American Cookies and have a love of cookies and snack brands and um, wrecked my first car uh, picking up a cookie cake for my 16th birthday. So uh, finally decided to jump into the franchise world with Great American Cookies, which then led into all of our partner brands. And Tanner, you've had other brands in the past. So why the, the two you're associated with now, why those? Yeah, the, the true answer is I was looking for concepts that didn't require as many people. So Sola Salons and Perspire Sauna Studios were significantly less labor intensive than the previous concepts. Okay. Yeah, I got into Annie Ann's originally, uh, historically through some family members that were in it as well. I always enjoyed the business model because it's fairly simple for the, food, for the food industry and the snack brand industry. Uh, no fryers, uh, vents, hoods, anything like that. And we can make a big impact uh, on how you train your staff with an impulse buy environment. I really like that impulse buy environment. And then the other brands we kind of trickled into by virtue of being associated with focus brands and co-branding from there. And my journey was a little unique. Uh, I was actually the CIO of Massage Heights on the Zor side uh, when I became a multi-unit franchisee. My wife and I fell in love with the brand. Um, so I got to kind of go through a different type of diligence process. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we, we fell in love with the brand. We actually were down in San Antonio for a while doing some project rollout work, my wife and I were, uh, before we had kids. And we got back to Indianapolis and we were like, we should bring the concept here. It's, it'd be, it would do really well. And so yeah, we, we signed on and did three, so yeah. Awesome. So as a franchisor, I, I tend to describe my job is protecting and building the brand. So as a multi-unit franchisee, what do you, can you just sum up your job in just a few kind of sentences? So, Matt G, what do you think about that? Uh, at, this, at this point, uh, with having the, the, they're established now, we're not, we're not opening new uh, early on in the process. Your, your role's very different. But now at this point, it's just focused on leadership of the, of the locations, right? Because as a multi-unit, you cannot be in every single store all the time. Uh, you know, talking with and being with your people. So for for us, my wife and I, who predominantly does a lot of the operations, uh, it is all about our, our managers and making sure that they're an extension of us while we're not there. What does that look like tactically? Are you doing weekly calls, monthly calls? How, much, how often are you spending time face-to-face -face with your managers? What does keeping your managers happy look like? <laughs> I think it changes week by week. Uh, no, we are, we are with them weekly, uh, in person. Uh, as well as just constant communication. I mean, we're a resource for them. I mean, we act as support for them, basically, uh, to make sure that they're happy, that things are going well, that we're, we're in touch of what's going on at the, at the locations. And other, Matt, uh, you have across multiple brands. So do you have an infrastructure that works across all those brands? And what does keeping your managers look like, happy look like for you? Yeah, so, so my where my role is with as the franchisee also kind of ties into Zignal, but it's to keep consistency across all of our locations um, and to try to stay ahead of the curve uh, as problems arise, you know, like little things like tasks being left off and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff creeps up on you and you don't realize that your manager three hours away is, uh, you know, slowly slipping under until shit hits the fan, pardon my language. Uh, so it's trying to stay ahead of that and keep consistency on the front end to avoid uh, a big mess on the back end. And we do that through through uh, making sure, I think one of the big things that we've done a really good job of is making sure that about every 10-ish locations has a layer between them and, and home office. Um, and, and there's constant training and, and where you've always got a second layer of defense to where obviously we always keep our stores open. But I think it's not getting too much more than 10 or so locations with a regional manager over it and having that extra layer of infrastructure, which uh, initially I know we were kind of timid to do because of, uh, you know, it, it costs a lot a significant amount of money to hire that person. However, sales and performance more than justify it once we've kind of got into that. And CJ, I'll go to you. So earlier when we were talking about 16 handles, he talked about feeling like not, he doesn't ever want to feel removed from the customers. So how often are you, for lack of a better term, eating cookies out there in the field? <laughs> um, I visit stores weekly, uh, predominantly my Nashville area stores. I've got stores in Nashville, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, and Knoxville. Um, my Memphis and Knoxville, I end up going there once a month, once every other month. Um, but because I do have stores in my backyard, I end up popping in more so just to be a cheerleader and uh, check in with the team um, and, and get a cookie or, or some ice cream. Absolutely. 
So obviously labor is a big conversation. We all know it. Um, what, what does that mean for you, CJ? What are the hot topics amongst your labor teams out there in terms of hiring, retaining them, training them, all that yummy stuff? Yeah, so it starts at the top, obviously. So I have a VP of ops who really oversees, you know, the day-to-day uh, of all eight of my stores. Um, and then, like Matt said, area managers beneath him so that we do have that second layer of defense. Um, and then on, on the, you know, store level, uh, each market's unique. Um, we've, you know, resorted to staffing agencies uh, in some markets to help us um, with, you know, keeping stores open, keeping stores fully staffed. Um, but really just, you know, making sure that we're not running too lean and that we always have enough people uh, there so that they feel supported, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the day, the night, you know, the weekends, you know, all that. So Tanner, you mentioned kind of getting into some people light brands, but you still have to have some people. So what's your approach on that as someone who's kind of wanted to scale back on like the heavy, heaviness of needing so many people? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the solo brand uh, by nature, you know, it's salon suite rental. So we don't really have a high staff count on that business. One of the reasons I really wanted to pivot into wellness, um, aside from having more of a personal passion, I think with what I'm seeing in the labor market right now, there is a push to want to be into wellness. And so for me personally, finding something and finding brands that I'm, I am passionate about, I know there's going to be a core value and culture fit. And so it's continuing to, to seek after the right people, not necessarily looking at experience, more so looking at skills, as well as core value culture fit, um, I think are extremely important to me. How much of your franchisor is bringing that to you versus what you kind of know you want? Like how much are you rocking and rolling on your own in that process? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for for me, like uh, Perspire's in development, but this is my fifth brand. And so I think having a very strong concept of what I want culture to look like, um, while obviously fitting it into the franchisor's mold. You know, we want to align with the franchisor's culture and core values, but at the same time, you know, at the franchisee level and at the local level, we want to have our own culture. And so I think it's a, it's a happy marriage between, um, you know, finding alignment between the two. I'll stick with you for one more question, Tanner, is what do your franchisors think about you being, this is a tell-all, friends, what, what do they think about you being a franchisee of multiple brands? Like in the discovery process, like what, talk to us about kind of their feeling on that. I, I think it's a huge advantage. I mean, um, I'm not just selfishly saying that because it's me, but um, I think any franchisor um, should consider finding multi-unit, multi-brand operators in that, um, you know, I am bringing a lot of experience from other brands. Um, it's not anything that I've come up with. It's just pure experience and seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. Um, being able to experience brands at different, la- different stages of growth to understand what does the current stage look like, what does the next stage look like, and what does a couple stages look like, um, you know, to, to be able to bring in multi-unit operators, especially on like an advisory council level, for, for an example. Um, it's just shared best practices from other brands. So in my experience, you know, I'm, I'm looking for franchisors that um, want multi-brand operators, and at the same time, I, I think for the most part, it's been appreciated. That's awesome. And Woven, Matt, which is what we're now calling you. Um, how do you think, for folks who are multi-unit operators, and, and you have three, right? Three massage hats. How do you know when it's time to add another? And, and, and in also, how do you know when maybe it's time to, to pull in a different brand into your portfolio versus going deeper with your existing partnerships? Yeah, so going deeper into your existing partnerships, I think, would largely be based around how things are going for you, right? You're going to know that. You're sitting in that business. You're operating that business day to day, and there's a lot of factors at play there, right? Do you have, do you have available territory? Are you able to expand uh, from a physical footprint standpoint? Uh, I know one thing we run into within the massage industry as a whole, not just Heights, but like every brand in the space is struggling with staffing right now. So, I mean, one of our biggest key things isn't just the general uh, workforce concerns that every brand suffers through, uh, but specifically in our industry is the massage therapist, the esthetician. These are licensed individuals. There's not enough of them. I won't bore you with all the details. Uh, but for us, when we're evaluating, you know, we we want to do more. My wife and I are very entrepreneurial, and so it really comes down to, you know, can we? I mean, like ours is a staffing concern, right? That that prevents us from going further. So when when we start looking around to other things similar to uh, Tanner, right? Like we're, 
we're not looking at people heavy stuff because that's what's capped us in this current environment isn't the viability of the business or the brand or the demand from consumers. It's literally there's not enough people to provide services. So when we look at other concepts, we're looking at those that uh, don't have that same kind of risk in, in the, the people side of things. Yeah. And Tanner, I asked you this yesterday. Whenever you get an, ad, a, a, uh, an FDD, what do you turn to first? Yeah, uh, for me, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling existing operators. You know, that's where I feel like I get the most um, information. But at the same time, when you're in the world of franchising, calling a, a, um, another operator in another system, it's a very different conversation. It's, it's a connection. It's not an interview. And so um, I feel like there's a huge advantage to, to calling as many operators. You know, if you're evaluating systems, in my own experience, that's where the, the most valuable information has come from. And what are just a few of those key questions that, like, what's the first question you ask them? Uh, Open-ended questions always seem to work the best. Um, you know, how's it going uh, is usually what I start with, and, <laughs> and they kind of take it from, from there. You know, I think um, for the most part, it's just, it, it's, it's less about digging and, and more about um, asking with curiosity, with gener you know, genuine intent, and getting to know the person, the operator, the market that they're in. You know, there are variables outside of, um, talking to a single operator. And that's where I think if you have consistent conversations with as many operators as you can, that's where you can really you know, fit the puzzle piece together to understand how it's gonna implicate you. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, let's talk about technology, because we've been talking, Matt G and I, we've been talking a lot about technology. Uh, Zingle Matt, we've also been talking a lot about technology. What technologies, what, talk, talk to the franchisors out there. And as a multi-unit franchisee, what do you expect from them by way of a technology stack? And where as a franchisee are you kind of gonna do your own thing? Yeah, so, and this kind of ties into the hiring aspect of, of, of what we were talking about a second ago in the employee retention. Um, but from a franchisee's perspective, <clears throat> what we kind of look for from a franchisor and this is kind of one of the things that Signal thrives in, is, is obviously the franchisor typically, not typically, always has, say, in the point of sale system. And most of the larger franchisees in the market um, have a portfolio of multiple brands that, 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 without doubt, have multiple point of sale systems. So I think one of the things the franchisees would really like is we understand that, that you're going to use multiple point of sale systems. We have no say over that, and that's part of what we signed up for. But working with point of sale systems that have access to use the tools that we choose on our own, which is becoming really prevalent in the space right now. Uh, recently, everybody lets, as long as you have access to an API, it makes it a lot easier for the franchisor too. We say, hey, we can't provide this for you, but here's somebody I can. You know, Zignal's one of the examples. We provide one of the services. We have tons of competitors out there too. Uh, so I think it's being flexible in what, and letting your franchisee pick the tools they want to use, but making sure that they have access to their data so they can plug them in. Um, yeah, sorry, we'll leave that one at that. <laughs> I, I figured, Matt, you have something to add to that. On the, like, what, are you seeing as, what are you seeing as some technology trends or opportunities that we have in the franchising industry? Yeah, so one of the, I mean, let's try to stay off the soapbox as much as I can, but one of the things after 15 years of consulting in the space and being on the supplier side and getting to work with a lot of great brands over the years and in different industry segments is that there's, there's a gap in our franchise world between Zor and Z, right? Um, Zors have a different type of business to run than, than Zs do, right? You're operating two different businesses, but you're operating them together. And the current tech stacks that are available today that help Zors, they really solve macro problems for their, for their business, right? And they don't offer a lot of day-to-day -day value for the Zs, except they're, they're told to use them. And they're, and they're there and, and everything, you know, the Zor's happy with them. But then the Zs are, are left to go deal with a lot of tactical day-to-day -day stuff, right? Like they're, they're putting out fires, they're, you know, somebody just called in, they gotta go do this, they gotta hire somebody, somebody just, whatever, they, they're, it's a mess. And so Zs left to their own devices go out and just start collecting tools. Right, they they start uh, Google Sheets and a and a G Drive, and I got some Excel files over there, and God knows what else, and they just pile it all together, and really both sides suffer as a result of this, uh, simply because there's there's not a good flow of information either way, because everything stops from the Zor at the Z level, and then the Z has to repackage it down into some other form to get it to their people, the people actually implementing your brand, 
And then from the Zor side, they don't have any visibility into all these dozens of different siloed areas of data that, that are actually operating their business, right? And so they lack the visibility and the aggregation back up. And it's really that, that divide and that gap that I hope to see solved in the next few years. I mean, we're working on it at Woven. There's some others working on it as well. But there's, there's some, a lot of really good stuff, I think, coming there that are going to kind of disrupt some of the current players in that space and provide just a fresh, different way to collaborate while still protecting joint employer and all the other necessary things that regulatory has uh, within this world. But uh, I think that'll be exciting. And one other thing I have to add, because it hasn't been brought up at this conference shockingly yet, but is AI, right? It's ChatGPT. We, we're working on it right now. I mean, any technology company's got to be having some some play in it right now. It's 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 going to radically change a ton of stuff that's that we all take for granted today. It's within the next year, we'll be having very different conversations. You want to add to that? Yeah, I want to add one last thing that I, that I left out is, is as a franchisor, which I think there's a ton in the room, more than franchisees, one thing that franchisees cannot stand and, and get very skeptical is when you make them and pile on to their polling fee or their technology fee, the, the first thing that goes through a franchisee's head is what kind of kickback are they getting, right? And so the less that you can require of them to have and the more that you can allow them to choose on their own, that goes a long way. There's no, it's, it's, you know, it might be 20 or $30 a month, but they say, oh, now you're required to have this as $20 a month, which doesn't mean anything to the business itself, you know, $20 a month. It's the principle behind and the skepticism that it brings up to the table when, when you're required to have next XYZ tech solution um, that, that you may or may not want to use. Let me stick with you on that, because one of the um, things that Neil brought up about on one of his bullet points was about pushing the franchisor. So I want to hear from all of y'all on this, but specifically with you, Matt, what you're just saying. How much say do you feel as a franchisee you have? Like, do y'all, I mean, how, how much say do you want in new things that happen? Or even just like the rollout of way things come uh -huh. from the HQ. I'm sure you have some strong opinions, but this is a tell-all. So let's yeah. hear it. Well, it was CJ and I were having this conversation uh, before we got up here. And I think, uh, you know, b with Focus Brands, which is where 95% of our, our locations are, and then CJ's with, uh, with Great American and uh, Inspire. Fat Brands. Fat Brands, sorry. Fat, you know, mixed up. Uh, we have minimal say in everything. And I think that that's kind of what we sign up for as part of that. I think as, as, as they continue to get acquired, you know, when I was at Annie Ann's originally, I'd call Ann Byler if I had something to say, you know, and now they're owned by Rourke and they're, they continue to grow and, and be compounded with other brands. And every time that happens, we have less and less say as franchisees. I think, um, I think the expectation is probably a lot lower for me than maybe for Tanner or somebody else as to what we can actually dictate. We're lucky if we can get a fact member to get a word in with the president sometimes. Uh, not always, but, uh, but generally speaking, we, but that's what we sign up for. So I think you kind of know what you're getting into, especially now as to what, how much say you have or not. At the same time, I'll talk to a Sonic franchisee or, or another brand that they think that we have the most freedom in the world. They're like, they really listen to you guys. And I'm like, wow. So, so I think it's, uh, it's unique per brand. But at the end of the day, I didn't sign up to buy Matt's pretzels. I signed up for Annie Ann's. And that's kind of part, part of what you sign up for and part of what you figure out in the dating process. Yeah, love that. So Tanner, obviously one of your new brands is more emerging with Perspire. So what, talk about the voice that either like you expect to have within the brand or even they're kind of looking to you to bring given your other experience. Yeah, I mean, and Matt kind of hit it. it. It really depends on the on the brand. I think um, for those of you looking to explore new brands, this should be part of the diligence process. You know, what does the communication look like? What's the size of the brand, and, and what can I expect? Um, for Perspire, for example, um, we internally created a, a, an, an advisory council on the franchisee level very early on. I mean, with with 15 open locations, we created an advisory council. Intentionally, um, and luckily the franchisor was very receptive to that. But for emerging brands, you know, I think um, you have to find the <clears throat> the right balance of um, making sure that the conversation's happening, but also setting those expectations early on. Um, but me personally, it's a huge part of the brands that I, that I'm getting into, and especially on the emerging brands, um, you're gonna go through trial by error, and there's no way around that. Um, the best way you can do that is to, to, to create a setting where you can hear as much feedback as possible and listen to ideas, listen to best practices from the field. And so, you know, the smaller the brand, the easier this is. Um, that said, um, you know, I think that there are large brands that do a really good job of this. So at the franchisee level, I think 
push your way through into an advisory council. My experience has been exceptional. You have um, a line of communication to the franchise or like you really can't have as um, you know, one-off franchisee. And on the flip side for emerging franchisors, um, I would empower you to consider creating an advisory council earlier than you're comfortable with because um, I think you can learn a lot and especially if you can find multi-unit operators from multiple brands that are coming into your young system, um, they'll have a lot to share. And again, as long as your expectation setting correctly, um, you can take the ideas and execute if you will. But the fact that you're listening goes a long way with the franchisees. Totally. CJ, let's hear from you. So some of the brands you're aligned with, I mean, they've been around for a while. So what does pushing the franchisor look like for you? Yeah. So um, I've been the past president of the Franchisee Advisory Council and you know, being involved in that has created a wonderful through line of communication. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, we do have nostalgia on our side, but we have to remain relevant in, you know, the year we're in and in, in the markets we're in. So it's towing that line, you know, um, whether that's in logo development or product development or anything else, you know, making sure we're paying respect to, you know, where we came from and that a customer in 2023 recognizes the same product that we were putting out in 1980. Um, but while still remaining relevant and, you know, allowing franchisees, um, you know, to participate in that as well. Anybody want to add anything else to how to push the franchisor? Well, Woven, Matt, you've been on the franchisor side. You've been on it all. So how can, how can multi-unit owners especially push their franchisor? What does that mean? Uh, well, as so first off, there's nothing more frustrating for a franchisor, and, and I'll say this from sitting in the seat, is that they're just, excuse me, bitching to bitch, right? Like, you you got to filter all that stuff out, right? So if you want to really be heard as a multi-unit franchisee, you have to make sure that you're bringing, you're bringing constructive criticism, right, uh, on things that can be changed, right? Because at the end of the day, I did not buy into Matt's Heights or Matt's Massage or whatever, right? Like, you, you buy into a system, right? And you have to live within that system. Now, of course, change is ab abundant and it's always happening. And so you have to be adaptable and, and part of the relationship between Z and Zor is a, is a feedback loop, right? It's, hey, this is, this is changing, our consumer's changing, or whatever it is, in, in kind of appropriately bringing that up, uh, but in a constructive way. Because, uh, you know, in all the brands I've worked with, uh, they have a list, uh, not written down anywhere, of course, but it's like there's these certain Zs that just are very vocal and rarely are ever like constructive with it. And, and the Zor just tunes them out, right? Uh, appropriately. I, I think the Zor needs to because otherwise they'll, they'll be chasing squirrels all over the place. And But if you're not bringing, as a multi franchisee, if you want influence, like you have to you have to approach this as the business partnership it is and, and bring constructive feedback, not just ridicule or criticism and things like that. So there has to be a, a mutual respect and understanding. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that. You know, the more willing you are as a franchisee to test what you're what you're pitching, um, the better. And of course, again, it, it depends on the size and scope of the franchise or their willingness to 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 test new things. But um, I am never gonna bring an idea to my franchise or if I'm not willing to execute, implement, and pay for that test in, in my own stores. And so you have to be able to put your money where your mouth is. If you have an idea, awesome. Sometimes the franchise or will, will let you play with it, but you also have to be willing to execute on it. Yeah, love that. Well, let's stick with you real quick. So let's talk about mistakes, fellas. What are some mistakes you have made? It's a tell-all. What are some mistakes you've made as a multi-unit franchisee? Yeah, uh, uh, for me, like, it, it, I think a lot of it comes down to ego, right? When you get multiple brands, you want to grow quickly, you want to be the biggest in the system. Uh, for me, I got into a brand that I shouldn't have. Um, I was um, in a, a really fast-growing waxing concept, um, got attracted to the eyelash extension um, concepts, and while there was a lot of... Um, synergy between the concepts, it wasn't the right time for me. I think I was so much better off putting my, you know, eggs in the basket that was working instead of getting distracted with a new concept. Um, and so, you know, I think being really strategic with your growth, and especially if you want to develop multiple brands at the same time, um, you have to have a strong vision for what that looks like, but you also have to be patient. 
Um, it, you know, everybody in the room wants, wants more locations. It's awesome to say you have 50 somethings, but you can operate five somethings and make more in a lot of cases than you can with 10 somethings if done properly, you know, with five. And so for me and my experience and in my own opinions, you know, it, it, there's a lot of ego when it comes to comparing yourself to other franchisees or other multi-unit operators, um, and being patient, but also much more strategic with that growth. Um, that's a mistake that, you know, I, I've made and wish I wish I would have avoided. Well, this is young conference, so we have to be, you know, we have to make mistakes while we're young, right? Uh, who else wants to share a mistake? Single man? I'll kind of piggyback off of what Tanner said, and, it, and it's, you're looking for quality, not quantity. And a lot of times quality is not just AUV, it's the purchase price. Uh, we have to acquire through, we have to grow in our industry through a lot of acquisition. There's not that many more enclosed malls out there. And I think making sure you kind of stay in your lane, uh, don't get caught up, like you said, with your ego. But I also think that that um, it really is a quality, not quality thing. And, and it took us a while, and I think I've learned the hard way, that the AUV is not the determining factor in quality all the time. Uh, you got leases to factor in, you got uh, purchase price, financing uh, platforms, things of that nature. So all that stuff weighs in. You know, people tell you how many units they have. They don't tell you what their EBITDA is on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So one more question for you, Matt, while we're with you, is just on the capital side. When you get ready to expand, mm -hmm. do you, are you going into your piggy bank to expand? Are you taking on a capital partner? Like, what, what's your funding strategy to expand for multi-unit? Well, and that kind of goes back to what, what I was just talking about and some of the mistakes that we've learned from is uh, as opposed to being constantly concerned about growth, we're also very cognizant of what our debt ratio is, right? So as opposed to opening a new store, we, we focus really hard on paying down a lot of debt. Without getting too, we don't have much debt right now, but we hadn't opened many stores. But at the end of the day, our bottom line looks just as good as if we were to have opened a bunch of stores by paying off debt service. So until you're positive cash flow, that's another way to grow is knock your debt down. That's great. Please add to that. Yeah, Matt. Uh, well, not on the capital side, but uh, to piggyback off the overconfidence. So we were when we were opening up our locations uh, for Massage Heights. Like I, here, I was coming out of like the Zor side, right? Like I I had more information on this brand than any normal franchisee does coming into a brand, and so we wanted to go quick. Uh, we actually signed two leases uh, roughly around the same time because we liked both real estate plays. Uh, thinking that oh, we'll just we'll just pop two of these things open and we'll just g get going uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, and, and we were warned away. The, the Massage Heights team was like, yeah, probably not a good idea. And we're like, no, 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 we got this. We got this. We're good. We're good. Uh, so yeah, that's probably our biggest mistake coming out of the gate. Uh, doing two locations, I think they opened within, they were supposed to open within like four months of each other. And because of construction delays, build out, whatever, they opened in like 45 days of each other. Uh, and that was, uh, that was really traumatic to the learning curve. Uh, just getting in the shoes, becoming a uh, not only an operator but a multi-unit operator within 45 days, uh, really uh, was probably our biggest mistake getting into becoming a multi-unit franchisee. Uh, it really slowed down our break even on both locations as we struggled through a lot of artificially created problems that we put upon ourselves. And then by the time we got to our third location, two two years later, um, you know our our break even and ramp was. Uh, it was like a third of the time. It was a, it, just because we were way more dialed in and we should have spaced it out appropriately. So I would say for Zors, if you do have over-eager franchisees, is try to educate them early on on the appropriate way. Let them learn things. There will be things that they need to learn uh, because sometimes going a little slower initially helps you go faster and stronger later. Yeah. CJ, anything to add on that on mistakes or a capital strategy for growth? Yeah, so uh, mistake-wise, I've never made a mistake um, <laughs> going strong. Um, more so, I, I think, just my naivete when I got into it. I jumped in um, and bought three stores right off the bat, not knowing what in the hell I was doing. So I uh, got to learn on the job real quickly, um, which you know allowed me to learn you know from all of the mistakes I was making very quickly. So um, that was a great learning experience. And uh, like Matt Forbush, all of my growth has been through acquisitions. Um, so all eight of my locations have been acquisitions. So, you know, getting more creative these days on the capital structure, looking at more seller financing options, um, you know, less SBA, less conventional loans, just kind of getting more creative and seeing where we can line up with sellers to make sure, you know, acquisitions happen and 
at the end of the day that our debt service and, and debt ratios make sense. Right. Anything to add on this? Anybody else on, the, on capital strategy? A li- uh, sorry, not capital strategy. I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit. Uh, just a, a mistake I think I've made over and over again and, and now getting into my fifth brand. Like um, before I, I opened um, a location for the Perspire brand, I went to go work for another franchisee. So I was like, put me on the schedule for four weeks. I want to open, you know, I want to work open shifts. I want to open close shifts. So for the franchisees in the room, like the best piece of advice and probably the mistake I made early on, and again, I think this is kind of tied to ego. It's like, you can know everything about how to operate a store, but you can also know how to turn the key into the door, turn on the cash register, you know, ring somebody out. And so making sure that you truly know all of the ins and outs of the operation before you go multi-unit because you can't be in one place or you can't be in more than one place at one time. And so when you go multi-unit, if you don't know A to Z, everything there is to know, um, you know, it piles up on you really fast. And so, you know, and on the franchisor side, giving access to prospects or people that might not be familiar with your brand or with franchising in general, you know, creating programs or giving them access to, to work a shift, you know, not just go through franchisee training, but to work a shift um, that's a mistake I, I didn't make early on and, and something I will never get into a, a new brand and not work a shift in the store before I go multi-unit. I really appreciate that because as a franchisor, I have felt the same. Like the learning curve is just so much smaller and shorter for folks who are familiar with my brand. <laughs> and so obviously I'd love to have folks who are already coming to our classes and our instructors, but if they're not and they are in a totally you know, different market where they've never been exposed to us, I do have a requirement. They have to spend more time at my headquarters. They have to take, they ha- that's now in my FDD that they have to be in the brand more and work more classes. So totally appreciate that. Well, I'd love to turn it over to any questions folks have um, in our last few minutes here for my boy band. Yeah, Red. Forget the, the, the locations. you got a corporate staff, eight units, or however many each of you have. Help us understand how you decided, when you decide, what those thresholds are for adding additional support staff on your corporate team. So I invested early uh, in upper management because I knew I was going to grow. Uh, so I bought my first three stores two and a half years ago uh, and added uh, the first layer of upper management within three months of purchasing because I had other stores in the pipeline uh, in the acquisition process. So, um, you know, similar to what Matt said, you know, I think they have 10 stores per regional. We see it as four to six stores per regional and, and depends on geography too. Um, you know, if, if it's a tight, you know, cluster, you know, can never see more stores, but kind of in that range of four to six units uh, per, you know, regional area manager. Yeah, I, um, I exited uh, two brands last year, so I'm really at the ground uh, back in development. But um, to Matt's, uh, excuse me, to CJ's point, understanding what sort of a cluster looks like. You know, when do you bring in that second layer of leadership? How many locations can they support? And I think backtracking from there, you know, I think it depends on what your growth strategy looks like. For us, we always wanted to have the next layer of leadership in place before we needed them. Because the second that you stretch your team too thin, you lead to burnout and then the system breaks. So you know, having a manager at every location was something that's really critical to, to us. Making sure that there's a higher level of support before you think you need it, if, if the strategy is to continue to grow. Um, to kind of back up what CJ said, I said we're one per 10 and I see with my clients through Zignal, really once you get three to five, you gotta have another layer there. I think the more efficient you get, you can go to 10. 10 locations for me could be two malls because we co-brand within a mall. Uh, which leads me back to one of my mistakes I made, which is kind of getting out of my lane and going into a more fast, casual environment outside of the snack brands. So we try to now stay where we can easily cross-train our management between the brands we have. Uh, if you start getting outside of that, you can't, we, we can't take an Annie Ann's regional and also have them if we were to get into, let's say, McAllister's. That's just not going to work. Not because they don't have the competency to do it. It's just it's not feasible from, uh, for them to perform either job as we'd expect them to uh, if, we, if we put that on their shoulders. I got a question back here, if that's okay. I'm also Matt, great name, yes. franchise yes. founders. I wanted to get your opinion from a f- looking at it from a franchisor's perspective on required vendors versus recommended, specifically within real estate and construction, with the caveat that the franchisor is not making any margin or rebate on it. 
because you're in very specific real estate locations, especially some of the snack brands. So do you rely on the franchisor to provide a lot of real estate and construction assistance? And are you okay if it's a requirement versus just a recommendation? So I, I would say that um, transparency is key to that whole situation. I think you've got to lay out the, what the expectation is up front during the, what I call the dating process. Uh, and I think that if, if there is any sort of kickback or anything coming like that, full transparency is what matters. If I know that you're telling me that because it's what you found best from your mistakes, things of that nature, I'm 100% on board with it. Or you can get me to be 100% on board with it. If I know that you know, you're going on a, a full paid ski trip, uh, with the guy who you're making me use, then that's that's a different story. <laughs> I, I I tend to see both. I've operated uh, with both in different concepts. As a multi-unit, multi-brand that's mostly developed in Chicago, I have vendors that I want to bring to the table. Um, at the same time, I think if the vendors you have in place that are required are getting the job done and they have more experience building the thing. So, for example, when I got into Soul Salons, you know, their uh, recommended... Uh, GC partner built over 300 locations. So for me, they can do it way better than my GC and I can figure out how to build one. And so I think it depends on the vendors you have in place. One other thing that I've seen in concepts I really enjoy is it's required vendor or you have to go through a vetting process. It's $1,000 if I want to submit a potential new vendor. And so you have to be really serious about submitting a potential vendor. I have to understand that's going to cost me a grand for the franchise or to vet a vendor, but if like a GC is a, 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 an important enough um, vendor that for me on a you know 1,500 to, to 2,000 square foot space, I want to use my contractor and I'm willing to spend a grand so that you're not eating the cost um, you know, to, to vet the vendor. So I think I've seen it both ways. As a franchisee, if I'm told this is the vendor that you're using, I'm okay with that as long as the expectation's been set and the vendor can get the job done. I would, I would say from a, from the Zor hat side of things, right, is identifying like what differentiates you, right? You, you own and control the brand, right? That is your pretty much your primary purpose, right? So if you're going to make something required, it really needs to be due to the fact that it's protecting the brand or it's something specifically unique to the brand that only your industry or segment or whatever is going to make sense for that particular vendor. It could be mill work or it could be the reason your GC does something that's specific that is uniquely kind of gives your brand that feeling that customers are expecting when they walk in. And then just make everything else recommend, recommended because when you are when you start working with franchisees, right, it's, um, you, you don't want to spend too much political capital and things that aren't critical, right? Because you'll burn that out and then you'll start getting just questioned on everything. Uh, so I would say focus the, the recommend, or focus requiring on what is actually uh, like brand specific, you know, your brand equity pieces. I think we have time for one last question, Ryan. Yeah, one last question. Okay. Mr. Thanks. Dallas, excellent last name. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, CJ, question for you. <clears throat> in, the, in the process of finding brands, how do you find businesses that are willing to sell? And then a follow-up question is, when you do the sell of financing, how do you structure those deals? Yeah, so... Um, I've kind of positioned myself in the past two and a half years within my brands as being pretty much the only acquirer. So I get calls weekly from um, other franchisees wanting to sell. Um, I can't buy every store, uh, unfortunately, but that's been the best you know lead gen for me is just letting the franchisor know, hey, if you hear of somebody that's looking to exit, tell them to call me first. Um, and then on the seller financing, I actually haven't done any seller financing deals to this point, but, um, you know, that's where I think there is opportunity to get creative. Um, you know, especially as, you know, um, a franchisee may be looking to exit to retire. So, um, giving them, you know, a structure that allows them to, you know, create additional income for the next however many years, um, can be super appealing to them. Awesome. Well, thank you to the guys and thank you for all your questions. And I'm sure you'll be happy to answer any other questions off stage as well. Thank you all so much. All right. That was excellent. Thank you guys very much. A lot of brain capital.